Nech maitski ha u amoa ituti kaduch kangi maita kiklai ikam golko. Welcome everybody to the Oregon Governors Conference on Tourism. My name is Bridget McConville. I am the Vice Chair of Tribal Council for the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. As a member tribe of the state of Oregon, I would like to welcome everybody to the conference along with all of the other eight tribes of Oregon. So a little bit about Warm Springs. We signed a treaty in 1855 with the federal government ceding 10 million acres to the government for land management activity and traditional continued use from our people. And we moved from the Columbia River to the reservation, which is now 642,000 acres. We have the reservation, which we live on, and we access lands in our seeded area, which is 10 million acres. We also have usual and the custom sites and stations within the state of Oregon. And we also have Aboriginal territories that we can also access within several states. Our tribe is made up of three tribes, the Warm Springs, which were located originally on the Columbia River above the Dells area. We have the Wasco people who are located below the Dells. And then about 20 years after the signing of the treaty, the Northern Paiutes come to the Warm Springs Reservation and we created what is the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. And I would like to thank the Oregon Governor and the Office of Tourism for the partnership and benefits of helping the Oregon tribes increase their tourism on their reservations. So before I let you go, I would like to announce our excitement that Canada will be reopening. It's funded and we're really excited. So we're looking forward to that and stay tuned. I wish you well in greeting and meeting and partnering and enjoying yourself in the lands of all of the Oregon's nine tribes. Really how tech. That's hello in Tekelman, the ancestral language of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians. I'm Michael Rondo, Chief Executive Officer. Our tribe is uniquely positioned in Southern Oregon. Beautiful landscapes call to travelers from all over the world. Last year, at our nationally recognized Seven Feathers Casino Resort, we welcomed 200,000 guests into our hotel and almost a million onto our casino floor. Thank you for including us and all the Oregon tribes in these important tourism discussions. And welcome to Oregon's Governor's Conference on Tourism. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tracy Kennedy, and I am an enrolled member of the Wararika Band of Northern Paiutes, also known as the Burns Paiute Tribe. The Burns Paiute Tribe is located one mile outside of the city of Burns on about a thousand acres of reservation land. We have about 430 enrolled members and are the smallest, most rural of the nine tribes of Oregon. Nonetheless, we are very proud of our history, our culture, our clean air, and endless skies. The Burns Paiute Tribe truly values our partnership with Travel Oregon. Oregon is and always will be our home. Welcome to the conference from the Burns Paiute Tribe. Peace out you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Don Ginger. I'm chairman of the Klamath Tribes, the Klamath, Modoc, and Yuskan Paiute people. We are about 6,000 members, and we are located in the upper Klamath Basin watershed near Crater Lake. That's part of our homeland and Klamath Lake. On behalf of the Klamath Tribes, I would like to welcome you to our homeland here at the gateway to Crater Lake to visit our Klamoya Casino, Klamoya Hotel Sleep In, and Crater Lake Junction Travel Center. And once again, welcome to the conference. My name is Kat Brigham. I'm the Board of Trustees for the Confederated Tribes of the Matali Indian Reservation. We are located in Eastern Oregon. 
Our traditional homelands are located in eastern Oregon and southeastern Washington. Our reservation was created in 1855, and we are located outside of Pendleton. We have long been a good host tribe and continue to welcome visitors to our region. Partnering with Travel Oregon is a valuable relationship as we grow our tourism assets like Wild Horse Resort and Casino, Temescala Cultural Institute, and more. Welcome to the Oregon Governor's Conference on Tourism. Nishina, Shayush Lauren Plot Plot Quichin H, Jesse Beers Leaning. Uh, greetings, everybody. I'm a Sayusla uh, citizen of the Confederate tribe, the Kus, Gonfo, and Sayusla Indians, and my name is Jesse Beers. For my tribe, I'm the cultural stewardship manager. We are located on the central Oregon, the southern Oregon coast, and we have two casinos, one in Coos Bay and a casino and resort in Florence, Oregon. We support, along with Travel Oregon, you coming in a good way to our lands and waters and participating in restorative tourism in our ancestral lands of 1.6 million acres. Dai, Mishina, hello, greetings on behalf of the Oregon Governor's Conference on Tourism. Isa, thank you. My name is Dolores Pigsley and I'm the tribal chairman for the Confederated Tribes of Salats Indians. Our members total about 5,500 people. They're from over 30 tribes and bands in the Northwest, mostly on the coast. We're located on the beautiful Oregon coast where you can visit the tribes, Chinookwins Casino Resort, watch the whales, go fishing, or stroll on the beach. I encourage you to visit our beautiful state and our tribe. And I welcome you all to the Oregon Governor's Conference on Tourism. And remember, it's better at the beach. Dice Law. Welcome, friends, and thank you to Travel Oregon for inviting us. My name is Jason Yonker. I'm chief of the Coquel Indian Tribe. We are located on the southern Oregon coast in North Bend. Our population is about 1,200 citizens. We have many locations on the coast that are incredible for tourism, but most importantly, the Mill Casino on Coos Bay of North Bend. The Mill Casino is the largest tourism attraction in Coos Bay, and we are pleased to be working with Travel Oregon and the governor through this conference, hopefully coming to better results for everybody in the state of Oregon. Again, Daisla, welcome friends to the Governor's Conference on Tourism. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the 37th Annual Governor's Conference on Tourism. You know, it's an honor for me personally to be able to follow the powerful welcome from the leaders of Oregon's federally recognized tribes. The theme of this year's conference is Future Forward. And I believe that in order for us to be able to move forward confidently and courageously it's also equally important for us to be able to reflect on and take lessons from the past. And that video reminds me, and I believe it can remind all of us, that our history predates what today we call Oregon. We at Travel Oregon have the highest respect and regard and value our government to government relationship with Oregon sovereign tribes. We have learned from the indigenous people of Oregon, and we continue to learn from them how critical it is that in, when we're promoting Oregon, we must be mindful of how we also must honor all cultures in Oregon, and to prioritize the environmental stewardship of the lands, waters, mountains, and natural resources that were here long before we were, and they must be preserved for generations to come. My friends, words are going to fail me in capturing how thrilled I am to be back here with each and every one of you at this year's Governor's Tourism Conference here in Sun River. To be able to shake hands or bump elbows or to hug or whatever you're comfortable with. 
I'm in for all of it. Um, but to be able to see your faces, to be able to connect, I'm just so thankful that we've entered this chapter of this pandemic and that we're all able to be back in person together. Thank you for joining us here. And, you know, I, I just have to tell you, for me personally, it's kind of an odd transition right now. I was commenting to somebody out here that every time I get up and leave the table, I feel I should reach for my mask. I feel I'm walking around with my coffee cup to demonstrate that I am actively eating and drinking wherever I go. <laughs> I, it's become pretty Pavlovian after two years, has it not? I mean, it's just kind of what we do. I, when I was headed out on my first business trip um, a, almost a year ago now, it was, it was uh, May of last year, I pulled the suitcase out of the closet, I threw it on the bed, and didn't really realize was what was transpiring until my wife walked by the bedroom again and she said, you've been standing there for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I've forgotten how to pack. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be able to pack in about 10 minutes, right? It didn't matter if it's three days or three weeks. It's like, you, just, you could just do this. And it's like, I forgot how to pack. Um, I hope each and every one of you enjoyed the awards ceremony last night. We were so honored to have the governor join us, of course, and to hear her words of support. Amy's message of hope was so transformative and so inspiring. Wesley, with K2 as our, as our MC last night, did such a masterful job. To be led over here by the bagpipers from Ben Fire and Rescue was just an absolute treat. And to all of our award recipients, your acceptance speeches were so moving. I mean, you took us to church last night with your, with your acceptance speeches. And I left feeling so inspired, so proud to be part of this industry with each and every one of you. Please join me in giving one more round of applause to everyone who was recognized last night. <clears throat> I have the deepest gratitude and appreciation for the dedication and leadership of all of our award recipients. And for each of you, our entire industry and the way we continued to function over the last few years. It has been a long and winding road. Our industry was hit hard and fast with the impacts of the pandemic and the steps that were taken to mitigate its spread. Yet Oregonians, our communities, and all of us in the travel and tourism industry were resilient. And we've come a long way along the path to recovery. And our spirit remains unquenchable. And our determination is stronger than ever. That, my friends, is called resilience. I believe it's fueled by hope. Now, some may say that hope is not a strategy. Perhaps not. And to be clear, I don't see hope as the endpoint of a strategy, but it is absolutely an indispensable ingredient. It frames the strategy's narrative and it allows for creative and optimistic adaptation. You see, I believe in the power of the travel and tourism industry. I believe it has the potential to create a better life for all Oregonians, preserve this place that we are privileged to promote, and to transform the lives of all who travel Oregon's waters and paths and byways to experience her grandeur, her mysteries, and her personalities. This is my hope for the travel and tourism industry. This is my hope for us. The next few days are gonna be about reflecting on where we've been, appreciating where we are. But most importantly, it's about pushing forward into the future. A future with that same spirit of collaboration and innovation that has helped Oregon's travel and tourism industry become the primary driver of Oregon's economy continues to thrive. Two years ago, as I mentioned earlier, we experienced the sudden impact of COVID-19 on our industry. You may not know this, but nearly 40% of all jobs that were lost due to the pandemic, all jobs that were lost, 40% were in our industry. 
Prior to the pandemic, travel and tourism in Oregon had experienced 10 consecutive years of growth and was generating nearly $13 billion a year in visitor spending. In 2020, that number was cut almost in half. And I'm pleased to be able to stand before you today, though, and share that the preliminary economic impact numbers from Dean Running and Associates tell us that in 2021, we regained $4.1 billion in visitor spending with direct travel spending now reaching $10.7 billion. My friends, we have recovered 66% of the visitor spending in one year that was lost in 2020. As a result of that, direct employment in the travel and tourism industry gained over 5,000 jobs last year and state and local tax receipts are up 38% compared to 2020. Local taxes alone are up 60% in 2021 over 2020. Now to be clear, I know we're not out of the woods yet and challenges remain, especially, especially in the area of workforce and the struggles that many of us are experiencing in attracting and retaining a workforce that was lost due to the pandemic. Yet I remain hopeful and I remain confident that we will learn from the past and we will chart a strong and stable and healthy recovery for our communities as we approach this new phase of the recovery together. We have a big day ahead of us with so many wonderful opportunities for us to be able to learn from and connect with one another. But first, because it's been a little while since we've all been able to be together and because there are some new faces among us, we put together a fun little icebreaker for you to create an opportunity for each of us to get to know one another just a little bit better or to become reacquainted. On your tables, you're gonna see some cards that are provided to us by Ken Henson and the Oregon Tourism Leadership Academy. And they contain all sorts of prompts to help get you started. So friends, grab a warm up for your coffee, chat with your neighbor, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you. Well, that was fun. There's certainly, I mean, there is no lack of energy in this room. I, I hope you all had a chance to learn a little something new about an old acquaintance or old friend or make a connection with somebody new. Anybody sitting next to Thelma Hagenmiller? Thelma, where are you this morning, darling? If you were sitting next to Thelma, you might have learned you heard me announce earlier, this is the 37th Annual Governor's Conference on Travel and Tourism. Thelma's been to 30 of them, 30 <laughs> Governor's Conferences. Thelma. <laughs> You've got everybody in this room beat, my dear. So, you know, our conference program and our registration fees benefit from the support of our many sponsors and exhibitors. Our sponsors for this morning's session, the Chinook Winds Casino Resort and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians together are the largest employer in Lincoln County. And they contribute significantly to the health and the well-being and the economic stability of their residents in Lincoln City. Please join me in welcoming Heather Hatton, the Public Relations Manager for the Chinook Winds Casino and Resort. Heather, come on up. I mean, you have to, I raise kids, so I've got all the Petri dish on me, so you're welcome for that. And following him, it's very difficult because he says words by Pavlovian, and, and it's true, right? Because I went to Idaho, I'm a new grandma, so that's really exciting. And uh, thank you. I mean, I didn't do any of the work. Um, I mean, I birthed her, which is exciting. Um, but I've been to Idaho three times, and I was talking yesterday in our travel, uh, tribal tourism group about how you can breathe when you come back to Oregon, right? I mean, when you, I've been to Vegas in the last week, it's, when you get a divorce, you do all the things, right? And so, you travel and you have fun. Um, so, but when you fly back in or you're driving back in, and I'm coming in off of I-84, and you're coming from Idaho, where they don't wear masks, and 
and it was it was kind of scary there for the last couple months. I'm like, they don't wear masks here, and it is very weird for us. And and I was just talking at my table. I'm always going to carry a mask, right? Because the small businesses in our communities might still require you to wear a mask. I have a 16 year old daughter who worked at a pizza place in Lincoln City, and she was having to police elderly people who were not willing to wear a mask during the pandemic. And it was frustrating to me because it's not her job to do that. It's our job to just be respectful of those small businesses because if they get sick and they have to go home, they shut down. It's not like Chinook Winds Casino Resort and all the tribes. We did shut down at some point, right? But we have a larger staff than these small bookstores or these mom and pop food carts, right? So let's be respectful of them. That's what I always think about. Um, and so always carry a mask. I have plenty in my car because I have kids who are athletes. Um, one thing I do like to do whenever I'm up here, I'd like to ask if there's any uh, veterans or active duty military in the audience, if you could stand for us so we can thank you for your service. Thank you. We sincerely thank you for your service. So anytime you see anybody, please thank them. So part of what we did over the last couple years is pivot, right? That's, I think that's a word that we've all used. And I'm a coach for um, golf, and I'm, I'm a coach for volleyball, and then there's basketball. And basketball uses the pivot foot. And if you move your pivot foot, you're called, you know, that you're traveling, right? But we've always maintained our pivot foot. We've always maintained that, you know, our, our base root of what we're here for, and that's tourism. It's to make people feel good about where they're going and they're, to make them happy. But we've had to alter that, right? We've had our pivot foot there, but we've had to change direction multiple times to find out, okay, where can we go now? We had queuing stations at Chinook Winds Casino Resort where people were smizing, right? We've all learned how to smize and kind of figure out. But underneath your breath, when that person's like, why do I have to wear a mask? You can just, and now we can't do that anymore, by the way. Because <laughs> although you think that we have all lost our ability to learn to read lips, we know what that looks like. We all watch the golfers on TV, we all watch those basketball players, and I watch my kids on the basketball court, and I'm like, pull her if she says that word out loud again. Um, we had to go to virtual events, we pivoted to that, right? Newport Seafood and Wine Festival for two years in a row has had to pivot for that, and they did an excellent job, and we, we partnered with them on those. Celebration of Honor, we had to pivot on that. We were not able to welcome people on site necessarily, but we really tried to do something that was safe and welcoming to everybody, and this year, hopefully, we can bring that back. We've got anniversary fireworks coming out. We were able to do that last year during August, not in June, because we were just coming out of our shutdown. So we're excited to kind of get back to normalcy, right? I mean, that's what we're really looking forward to. But I just really encourage everybody to remember that some, somebody's normalcy might be still wearing a mask. And that's, that's unfortunate because for those of us who don't like to, but being a mother of three children and now a grandson, just be respectful of that. These kids had to wear these masks playing in 85 degree weather sometimes. I mean, I watched my 16 year old do that and they never complained, not once. But on Monday when I brought my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter to school, she's like, Mom, I don't have to wear a mask today. I go, you better have it in your backpack. Because if something changes and that school district has to pivot, you're going to be ready. Luckily, my kids are athletes, and they know what the word pivot means. So um, I'm really excited about this week. I'm excited that it was sold out. Like I was, I, When I was talking to Lisa about how many items do I need, I was like, I need over 300 items? This is exciting, right? So I'm really, I'm really thankful, and just like Dee Pigsley said, I wish she would be here today, but it's better at the beach, but I think it's just better in Oregon, right? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Well said. It is better in Oregon, indeed. You know, and it's really good here in Central Oregon. All you've got to do is look around to understand how very special this place is. It's famous for its craft breweries, the Slopes of Mount Bachelor, the sixth largest ski resort in North America, by the way, and so many other outdoor adventures. But it's also known for their creative dedication to partnering towards a shared and healthy vision of tourism for the region. And it's my honor to welcome Julia Thiessen, the president and CEO of the Central Oregon Visitors Association to our stage to give us an official local welcome. Julia, come on up.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Visit Central Oregon, I just wanted to entice you with the beauty of our region and say a very warm welcome to all of you. I know it's been said before, but it's worth saying again. It is so good to see everybody in person. Who would have thought a few years ago we'd be this grateful just to see each other's smiling faces? And I think yesterday and last night was a testament to how much we miss that connection um, and networking and togetherness. So um, wonderful to see all of you on behalf of all of us. We're so excited that you're here. Um, we hope the video inspired you to go out and play. I know some of you are getting out tonight to do some snowshoeing or hiking or gaze at the dark skies. We encourage you to stay longer. I mean, we're sort of still working remote and maybe can get away with a little bit of hooky. Um, and of course, if you can't do that, come back and see us anytime. We welcome you with open arms and there's so much to do. We do have um, our uh, visitor center is located here in Sun River Village. If you want to pop in and say hello to the staff there. We also have a pop up desk um, just outside registration that will be staffed um, today and tomorrow. If you need any ideas of what to do, where to go, our experienced staff will lead you in the right direction. So enjoy your time here. Um, it's wonderful to be together. Um, I don't think I need to say it's been a tough couple of years for all of us and it's just great to see the inspiring stories. Um, I think I echo Todd's comments last night was wonderful. Um, I was really impressed with the, the stories that came out of the pandemic with the innovation and the leadership and the courage people have shown. While I personally banned the word pivot um, in my office and told people to please stop saying it, <laughs> we did a lot of it, right? We did a lot and um, last night's stories were a testament to that. So great um, as well as the Amy's very inspiring message of spreading hope. So I love the Travel Oregon theme of future forward and I think we all look forward to moving, moving ahead um, better and stronger together. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you um, over the next couple days. Um, just a few thank yous I wanted to say, first of all, to Travel Oregon, to Lisa Edel and Matthew Finn for putting this conference together. <laughs> Uh, they certainly made it very, very, look very easy to put a conference together in uncertain times. Um, and as I told Todd, I didn't do anything. I just showed up and here it is in our backyard. So thank you to the Travel Oregon team for giving us this space to come together. Um, I wanted to say thank you to our um, partners at Mount Bachelor. I know some of you have gotten out to enjoy um, their offer to get out on the mountain. And if you haven't, there's still time, as I mentioned. Um, obviously to Sun River Resort for hosting us here at their beautiful resort. So what a great place to be. And um, I wanted to thank the local artists who came out last night. Um, I hope some of you got to enjoy um, Katie Daisy and her work and um, the work that was showcased in the exhibit hall. Um, Katie Daisy and her partner Karen um, created the murals that you'll see around Central Oregon. Um, and I think that was a, just a nice showcase of the creative spirit that lives in Central Oregon um, that we highlighted in our makers campaign. So I welcome, um, appreciate them coming out last night. Um, and I think that's it for thank yous. Um, again, just excited to see all of you enjoy the conference. Look forward to two really great days of uh, robust programming and of course some networking and some beer and wine. <laughs> thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Julia. You know, it really is a great honor and privilege. It's just a heck of a lot of fun to be here in Central Oregon together. I'm excited to have us all be able to get out and explore just a little bit more of this outdoor paradise. So again, uh, there are still a few spots that remain available on the Wise Guides experiences later this evening if you are uh, able and interested to be able to get out and explore a little bit more of this beautiful place. Friends, to be candid with you, I'd originally anticipated using this time to be able to talk more about Travel Oregon's transformational strategy, as well as our next steps in reimagining tourism in Oregon. To that end, last month, we presented a draft strategy to the Tourism Commission, and we heard from members of the commission and from many of you, both in written form and some of you that testified uh, in pub provided in person, public, t I say in person, it was all over Zoom. You know, it's, okay, virtual in-person testimony. Um, and a bottom line though, Thank you. It was thoughtful, constructive, helpful feedback on this transformational strategy. This is big work. This is a heavy lift. I won't use the P word, but it, it's, it's emblematic in the work we're trying to do to plan, a, you know, establish a transformative framework for the next 10 years. 
we heard you, and we are listening and continue to listen. And this is why yesterday I presented an approach to the commission about how we can organize and engage and incorporate that feedback and develop a strategy that encompasses our role in strengthening Oregon's economy, reflects all of our shared ideals, and serves as a potent framework to guide Travel Oregon and the tourism industry over the next decade. Reimagining tourism in Oregon is going to remain a focus for the agency, as is our fervent desire to use this transformative framework and the subsequent planning efforts that will come to serve you as our co-creators, our co-collaborators and partners in this industry, as well as our visitors and Oregonians as well. From our inception in 2003 with the passage of House Bill 2267, and you'll forgive me for the brief history lesson here this morning, Travel Oregon's mission has been rooted in economic development. The Oregon tourism industry, the governor, legislators, private business owners, and trade associations knew that Oregon was so special that people from all over the world would treasure their time spent here, whether it's individually or with their friends and family. They were certain that the economic and the social value of tourism would be undeniable. They were right. They were absolutely right. Prior to COVID-19, Oregon's tourism economy had seen 10 consecutive years of growth in visitor spending, tax revenue, and jobs created. We launched award-winning marketing campaigns together. We led destination development programs statewide and helped inspire visitors to spend their time vacationing across the state of Oregon together. The pandemic may have impacted our economic growth, but not our spirit, never our spirit. Travel Oregon is a brand steward for our beautiful state and a trusted resource for visitors and Oregonians alike. So we adapted, we had leveraged our brand and our platforms to shift from promotion to messaging responsible travel during the pandemic utilizing the reach that we had in our social media channels and others to help communicate to in-state and out-of-state visitors alike how and when to travel safely, support local businesses, and how to recreate responsibly. In fact, you may not know this, but during the pandemic, TravelOregon.com actually saw record levels of organic search and web traffic. The informational content that we were providing consumers drove more traffic to our site than ever before, which gave us information about how our potential role could and should evolve into the future as we think about our role in this ever-changing industry. We also launched the Destination Ready program during the pandemic as a, as a way for us to aid in the economic recovery and enhance local livability. The projects awarded were crucial to ensuring that visitors and Oregonians alike had access to safe and enjoyable experiences as we continued our efforts to rebuild Oregon's economy. We invested nearly a million dollars in 34 different projects across the state focused on the development, the enhancement, and the stewardship of key visitor experiences. I think this program tells us something. I think it shows us how to make investments that support economic growth and add benefit to the residents of those communities is possible. Let's have a look. Tourism and visitation itself takes leadership. Destination Ready is really a program that allowed us to take leadership in tourism and visitation industry of helping underserved communities or those who have gaps in visitation. In 
the Valley, especially in 2020, beyond COVID impacting and decreasing hotel stays, we saw overuse in our outdoor spaces. And on top of that, the fires of 2020 really damaged two major communities in particular, and they have different needs that we're trying to identify and help support to bring the visitation industry back while trying to balance that basic human need of getting just the residents back into those communities. Having this opportunity to uh, work with Travel Oregon and the Destination Ready program uh, to find a project like the one we put together in the Mackenzie River was an incredible opportunity for us. We saw a need in these destinations that were really dramatically affected by wildfires and also being affected by the pandemic. We decided to create new product that brought visitors out to these areas and allowed them the opportunity to engage with stewardship and actively volunteering, as well as recreating. We look at our communities with equity and try and meet them where they're at and find these projects of which we can help lead, finance, or support in a way that helps bring them back up to where the rest of our community is. This application process allowed communities to say, here's our major problem, here's how we can address it, here's how you can help support us, and allowed Travel Oregon to reinvest in a community-driven way first. The shutdown due to COVID has really hurt our small businesses, and it is really hard on the community when we lose a cornerstone business or a business that just started up. And I think it's wonderful that we're able to respond in certain ways to COVID. It's important that we invest in our downtown because people come here to say, do I want to live here? Do I want to bring my business here? And they come to our downtown core and see that there are attractions here. I just think Albany is, has become closer and better together. And I think we'll see more and more of that as we start to recover from this pandemic. The Destination Ready program was an incredible benefit to us. It was pretty essential for my business and for the overall destination here in Oregon to, to have a speedy recovery. By collaborating and talking to each other and figuring out how we can work together as a single unit, as a destination at large, uh, we can really be impactful in helping everybody come back. I share this video this morning as a reminder because I see it as a reminder for all of us how much we can do when we work together. How even challenges can open doors to opportunities like this innovative new program, Destination Ready. Every one of us in this room knows that Oregon is a very, very special place. The experience of seeing the Pacific Ocean or the Painted Hills for the very first time the, the, the surprise that, you know, you may have come to Oregon because you've heard about great Pinot Noirs, but you also find out that we make pretty doggone good Tempranillos as well. <laughs> yeah. These moments are no doubt memorable. But what we've learned is that our guests also truly value the feeling of being welcomed. Feeling welcomed here. And experiencing what it actually feels like to be an Oregonian, if only for a few days. It's not only the scenic beauty and the incredible bounty that make our state an unrivaled destination, it's also the people that call this place home. And it's feeling secure and safe and included wherever they travel throughout the state. And it's also that these visitors and residents alike will also have the information that they need to be able to navigate those new adventures or revisit some of their favorite old ones. And we're all part of that. We are all part of that when we share our state with the world and we welcome visitors. That makes us, whether it's formally or informally, embedded in Oregon's travel and tourism industry. We're proud of our state, rightfully so, and we want to share it just share a little bit of Oregon, whether it's through our products or our places 
or our stories. So as we move forward on developing a transformational strategy for the next decade, we will take the experiences of the last two years, the information that was gathered in stakeholder outreach and the input from you and other partners in communities across the state to craft a strategy that reflects the reality of today with our aspirations for the future. That means building on our past successes and acknowledging that we still have more to do. It means prioritizing equity. It means recommitting to our role as stewards of the environment so that the beauty that attracts our visitors remains for future generations as well. It means identifying how to make Oregon a premier destination globally and in a way that is authentic to our values with respect for all people, all cultures, and all communities. Let's commit to that today. Let's commit today to further developing and contributing to an even more resilient tourism industry across the state of Oregon. To give us an idea of how, I, it is my pleasure to introduce someone who can speak to one of those destination ready projects that you saw featured in the video just a moment ago. The McKenzie Regenerative Travel Project is a partnership between the Willamette Valley Visitors Association, Travel Lane County, Cascade Volunteers, Global Family Travels, and First Nature Tours. And it resulted in a volunteer-oriented travel packages that were designed to support local lodging opportunities and properties in trail recovery efforts in the wildfire impacted area of the Mackenzie River Corridor. To speak to the power of partnerships, the power of environmental stewardship, and the power of regenerative travel, it is my great honor to welcome Kieran Wild, the founder and chief expedition leader of First Nature Tours, to our stage. Please join me in welcoming Kieran. Thank you so much for that inspiring intro, Todd, um, and for all your support with Travel Oregon. Wow, so it's, this is the first time I've been in front of this many people, probably ever, so bear with me. Uh, definitely since before the pandemic. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Great to see so many familiar faces, uh, especially from here down, finally. Um, I've had a lot of catch up with people and I can tell who follows me on Instagram because I had two kids since I saw most of you last, so. <laughs> yeah, as if the pandemic wasn't enough, I had two kids, um, but it's been great. I'm here to talk briefly about sustainability, a growing trend in our industry called regenerative travel, which we've heard a lot about already today, aka regenerative tourism, and the future of travel in general. But first off, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, just for those of you who don't know me, about my own journey to this stage. Personally, I've been an eco-warrior since I was a kid. Some of you probably remember the 90s cartoon, Captain Planet. That was me. I wanted to be that guy more than anything else. Captain Planet all the way. I was painfully obvious already at a young age that the world I was living in was being destroyed by people's actions. And I felt the need to do something about it. So I went and got a degree in restoration ecology. I went and spent five years working for the BLM, for the North Cascades National Park, and then eventually the Department of Ecology doing restoration work, planting trees, removing invasive species, things like that. And after several years of doing that, I just, I felt like I wasn't really doing enough and really me meeting my highest values in the way I wanted to. So I found my way into ecotourism. It felt like a great marriage of my skill sets. I knew a lot about ecology already, obviously, and I bartended a lot through college, so I had people skills. Uh, so it was kind of like the perfect marriage of those things, um, and I've been in tourism ever since. I started my own business called First Nature, which some of you are familiar with, back in 2013. Um, and fast forward to 2020, it's been great up until then, and uh, the first year of the pandemic, it, it really uh, it brought many of us the opportunity, myself included, to pause, uh, to take a minute, to take a deeper look at our lives from all sorts of different angles. And for me personally, that meant really evaluating where I was at with First Nature, what I was really doing with my life, and if I was really following my desire to be that eco-warrior that I thought I'd always be and to really like save the planet uh, like I always wanted to. So 
during that soul searching, I came, uh, I came to the decision to shift my focus away from just being about financial growth as a metric and to dedicate more of my time and more of my energy uh, to build a more sustainable ecotourism landscape in the, in the state of Oregon and everywhere else we work uh, with First Nature. So like the universe tends to do when you're on the right path, everything kind of fell into place almost in a magical way. Uh, we started working together with another tour operator in Washington State. We mentioned them, Global Family Travel to create regenerative travel projects in Washington and in Oregon. Uh, and then in 2021, as you now know from that awesome video you just saw with uh, help from Travel Oregon's Destination Ready Grant, Willamette Valley Visitors Association, Travel Lane County, uh, and the nonprofit Cascade Volunteers, we all collaborated to create the Mackenzie River Regenerative Travel Project. Actually, there's a slide over right there. Uh, we'll talk more about that if you want to come to my session. So that brings me to regenerative travel. What is it? I'm glad you asked, because I'm like here to talk about it briefly. Uh, everybody's heard of sustainable travel. That's the, that's the buzzword that's been around for a while. Uh, the concept of sustainability is nothing new. And when I had just entered the tourism world some 15 years ago, most companies were still using the phrasing ecotourism to talk about sustainable practices. Uh, the, the concept of sustainable travel was officially defined by the United Nations in 2002, and you can see that definition up there behind me. And since then, many NGOs have been formed to regulate the usage of these terms to prevent what inevitably happens with terminology and jargon, greenwashing in, in pretty much every industry. Um, so why rebrand? Why are we talking about regenerative travel? Um, my good friend and our colleague, uh, Krista Dahl, and I had a, a unexpected four and a half hour drive across the Arizona desert and talked about this a lot um, and had a nice healthy debate about whether it's valuable to rebrand and to like use a new word for something that's been around for a long time. But my opinion is, as you probably guessed, yes, I think rebranding is important. I think that, you know, for one, just keeping it fresh, keeping this terminology fresh in people's minds and getting people excited again ab about a new concept, it has its own intr intrinsic value. Um, I think that uh, sustainability in particular, it's kind of thought of like in terms of concepts like leave no trace where you're trying to leave the destination exactly as you found it and, and not change it at all. Um, or you're talking about carbon offsetting, which is really hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around and to really measure. Uh, the big difference here is regenerative travel, it, it really is about leaving a net positive impact on a destination. And that can be done through taking a, an active role in local stewardship projects like the one we talked about, the Mackenzie River. So just like with sustainability, there's a lot of environmental and social aspects to this work. But the overall message behind the word regenerative is about doing better than just sustaining where we're at. Last year, six nonprofits, including the Center for Responsible Travel and Tourism uh, and Sustainable Travel International, joined together as the Future of Tourism Coalition, which then established 13 guiding principles you see up there on the screen. These are the guiding principles of regenerative travel, which I encourage you to download a copy of from their website and to keep it on hand. We've all been given a huge opportunity uh, with this pandemic to reevaluate why and the how of our industry at large. Maybe the metrics we've been using for success no longer serve us. Maybe the success of DMOs like Travel Oregon should be measured more qualitatively and less quantitatively. Perhaps we should focus less on tourism dollars spent and more on the quality of visitors we are attracting, the quality of the products we're creating, and the social and ecological health of our destination that results. After all, if we want a future, it will have to be a sustainable one by definition. Please reach out to me if you want to talk more about creating a regenerative travel project in the Northwest somewhere. I'm all about talking about it. Um, you can learn more about the McKenzie Project in the session that I'm in about Innovative Oregon. Um, and I just want to leave you with a quote from a fellow Wisconsinite and a pioneer in the world of sustainability. He actually started the college that I went to um, in Wisconsin. Aldo Leopold. He said, examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Kieran. Beautifully, beautifully said. And if you ever wondered what it's like to be an experienced bartender and eco-warrior ethic, and what happens when that gets co-combined, it's Kieran, okay? Um, and 
you got two kids during the pandemic. My wife and I got a puppy. Um, but I'm <laughs> But it's been fun to watch the, the, the family develop on Facebook, my friends. So that's been, that's been really great to see. And congratulations again on, on that. You know, my friends, as members of the travel and tourism industry, it's incumbent on us to also make sure that Oregon is a place where all of us who travel the state, Oregonians and guests alike, enjoy their journey and they feel valued and they feel welcome. Through our transformational strategy, and in all we do going forward, we're committed to achieving this objective at Travel Oregon. So we must, and we will engage with and work alongside tribal and community leaders, local business owners, educational institutions, fellow state agencies, and industry partners to ensure that the guests we all welcome feel valued and are invited to share an even deeper connection with our state. Our marketing efforts at Travel Oregon have been a place where we've been able to be really intentional in prioritizing inclusivity and diversity. Through the creative process of the only slightly exaggerated campaigns, we've hosted focus groups to ensure that we're developing content that aligns with that mission of inclusivity. So that not only did folks see themselves in our advertising, but we were also authentically speaking with and reaching those diverse audiences. We're excited to continue developing these opportunities to further engage with BIPOC travelers and Oregonians. And here to share more about how we're working to ensure that all visitors to Oregon feel welcome and valued. Please join me in welcoming Katie Clare, Travel Oregon's Director of Marketing Services. Katie. Uh, thanks, Todd, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, to really get an understanding of how Travel Oregon can even begin to reach diverse audiences or authentically tell Oregon stories through our marketing, it's really important to understand our brand. Travel Oregon's brand is the core of what we do, how we show up in advertising, how we represent ourselves through content, how we communicate with audiences, how we make sure that we're aligned with journalists through earned media, and as Todd mentioned, our brand is our trusted resource for visitors and Oregonians. But our brand doesn't represent us, it represents Oregon. And Oregon is diverse and includes all that have called her ground home for thousands of years ago or until today. Trying to represent that in truth can be a little overwhelming. And honestly, we make strong efforts in this space but are constantly looking for ways to reach new audiences and to speak to, the, to, speak to them in a way that feels welcoming and inclusive. We've learned a lot over the past few years, me in particular, that it's critical to keep trying and that every effort to reach out and engage with and listen to a community who may not have felt represented before is a step in the right direction, a step towards Oregon becoming a more welcoming destination because that's what we do. We welcome people, we invite them here. So all of this goes into the thought and intention behind creating and refining Travel Oregon's brand. For our brand to be welcoming to all and to represent, destination, represent our destination, we work to determine a voice that is welcoming. And we can't do that alone. Beyond an incredible creative team, we, <laughs> we use Oregonians to guide us. We ask questions, we create space, we listen, and we get uncomfortable. For those that were able to, listen, to attend our governor's conference last year, we spoke to the work that we did with our BIPOC communities with our only slightly exaggerated advertising campaign. We've continued that effort with our upcoming advertising campaign that will launch this summer, Extraordinary is Ordinary. And we continue to recognize that we need to invite communities into the process to make it authentic and appealing. And we're never finished, as it should be. We're always moving to make our work feel more inclusive. Last year, we made some important updates to our brand. We updated our colors to be more ADA accessible. We defined our brand voice and made small but impactful updates through our style guide. One example is that one of our brand pillars was pioneering, and we learned from our work that through with tribal communities that this word sparked feelings of co being colonized by white settlers. In response, we changed pioneering to imaginative. These m updates might not seem that significant, but they help us help keep us focused on our mission and all the work that we do. You can see this through our brand voice, guiding travelers through our Northwest Wonderland. 
When defining how we connect with our audience and Oregonians alike, the role of a guide allows us to invite a diversity of travelers to join us. By framing up our marketing efforts through the lens of a guide, it speaks to the deep respect and knowledge of the land that Oregonians hold. Sharing Oregonian, Oregon from a guide's perspective also recognizes that Oregon is home to a diverse group of people who are experts in just about anything. Oregonians are warm and welcoming, generously, generously sharing their deep love for their craft and their state. So this is great, especially following Kieran. <laughs> Here you'll find imaginative, idealistic, and independent people, as well as thriving communities forging a new path. We're able to bring this voice to life in our work, and we're dedicated to expanding our point of view to make sure that we're designing our process to be inclusive. So as we start looking ahead and preparing to make action plans that will align with our transformational strategy, we will begin an effort and to bring in resident and new community perspectives into our brand evolution. These are critical steps that we anticipate will always be part of our brand conversation, how we stay true to ourselves and create space for voices that have been unheard. And we will make sure that it steadfastly influences our work and all of the words that you see. While I'm speaking of brand, you'll find this conversation purposely woven in throughout the sessions over the next two days and the work that Travel Oregon has developed and our new work that will be driven by this transformational strategy. We invite you to join us on that journey and to challenge us along the way. With that, thanks, Travel. Back to you. Katie, thank you. Appreciate you and appreciate how much uh, you and the entire team, our global marketing team, are, are doing in this particular space. I'm really excited about the work that lies ahead. Travel Oregon understands deeply that in order to preserve this place that we have the privilege to promote, we must treat Oregon with respect. People and the environment need to have the opportunity to regenerate. This means more than doing less harm or no harm. It's as Kieran told us, it's about leaving Oregon better. It's about net positive, leaving Oregon a better place for future generations. Ensuring that tourism's impact bring positive economic, socioculture, and environmental value to Oregon. And to ensure that, we've committed to using a destination stewardship lens through our work into the future. Now admittedly, Travel Oregon's work isn't always about leading. It's also about learning. And seeing the creation of great initiatives in action and being able to come alongside you, to support you, to tell your story, and to look for ways to further develop those opportunities and actions and move them out statewide. Last April, the Oregon Coast Visitors Association became one of the only destination management organizations in the United States to join the Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency Initiative, a declaration to take purposeful action. <laughs> it is a declaration to take purposeful action to reduce carbon emissions to 55% below 2017 levels by 2030. As part of this, ACFA is also taking innovative steps to invest in local food systems, helping to ensure that Oregon seafood is served up in local restaurants, supporting supply chains, and reducing waste and carbon emissions. It is my pleasure to welcome Marcus Hins, the Executive Director of the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, to tell us more. Marcus, come on up. Thanks, everybody. That photo is me. <laughs> I just have a beard now. Okay? All right. The mask just made my face grow. No. So, um, <clears throat> with all the craziness going on, you know, in the world, many of us are asking, like, what is tourism's lane these days, right? Well, um, looking at Dean Runyon reminded us that in 2018, visitors came to the Oregon coast and spent nearly $800 million on food services and food stores. It's more than lodging in our region. And so we feel that protecting these sales and keeping the money in Oregon is our lane. 
So you see, when the food we sell is not from Oregon, the money we just earned immediately leaves. It's like we're selling someone else's food and that's where the money goes. So local food systems, the jobs they create, the economic prosperity of communities are inseparable. In the same way that food production and the transportation of food are inseparable from climate change. Oregon seafood is the coast's unique food proposition, so I'll speak to that. A soon to be published two year study on seafood economics has concluded that of all of the seafood sold on the Oregon coast, 90% is not from Oregon, 90%. It's a very definitive study, it will be coming out in a few weeks. But um, it's crazy because planes are leaving with Oregon seafood at the same time other planes are flying in to seafood somewhere else. Plane by plane, we are increasing the carbon footprint inside our closed system of a planet while simultaneously shortchanging our communities and the visitor experience. These challenges exist because things aren't getting better. 20 years ago, OSU researchers documented large sections of the ocean with low oxygen or no oxygen. 15 years ago, tens of millions of oyster larvae died at Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery on Neatarts Bay because of changing ocean chemistry. 10 years ago, 900 family-owned commercial fishing businesses sued several dozen fossil fuel <coughs> industries because a huge pool of warm water formed out in the ocean that we called the blob. And eight years ago, the blob increased to 2,000 miles long from Mexico to Alaska. So I could go on and on about this. However, despite these challenges, opportunities do exist because the money that we spend and the money that we ask visitors to spend can be directed at regenerative experiences instead of activities which accelerate climate change. It's our choice. 20 years ago, the entire ground fish fishery in Oregon collapsed due to overfishing. Yet today, nine species of rockfish have recovered and have yet to find their way onto restaurant menus. 18 uh, species of ground fish are certified as best choice by Seafood Watch. But even this miraculous success is threatened because if there is no oxygen in the ocean, there are no rockfish tacos. Right? If the chemistry of the ocean continues to trend in the way it is, there will be no clam chowder, oysters on a half shell, because they won't be able to grow their shells. There will be no Dungeness crab mac and cheese. This is why Erica Sears, with the help of climate scientist Patty Martin, is nearly finished with OCVA's 10-year climate action plan for the coastal tourism industry. It's voluntary participation, no regulations, based on private sector solutions, right, which will simultaneously contribute to economic development and the environment. Full disclosure, Erica Sears loves Dungeness Crab Mac and Cheese. <laughs> Please help. Please help. This is very important. Despite these challenges, um, we will succeed together because we know from both experience and research, that visitors have a food fascination with Oregon. We know visitors love itineraries, right? When we say, go there and buy that because it matters, that's what they do. So you see, together, we can harness hundreds of millions of dollars in this economy and direct that money at regener regenerative visitor experiences <laughs> and increase our collective prosperity. Now photos we take of shiny tomatoes and smiling farmers must be accompanied by meaningful investments in our food system infrastructure. <laughs> wow, I want to 
want to say that again. <laughs> uh, so we're not trying to be the food system, nor the scientist, right? We're just finding out what our food system's friends are doing right and investing in that. Our effective role, our lane in this is additive, focused, measured contributions in ways that will raise the prosperity of food producers, quality of life for all Oregonians, elevate the visitor experience, all the while reducing our carbon footprint. This is not just good business sense, it's smart. It's the right thing to do. We all have an opportunity to step up, so let's do this together. Thank you. Marcus, thank you. Thank you for your incredible work. You, Erica, Akba, uh, it really is tremendous work and it's inspirational to all of us and I know it's inspirational for me and the team at Travel Oregon to be able to learn from folks. Like I said, it's, sometimes it's not about leading, it's about being humble and learning. From folks who are seizing opportunities to reimagine ways to support economic prosperity and livability across our state. It truly goes to show that in order to make Oregon a more equitable destination, a more welcoming destination, as well as stewarding our economy and our natural environment, this cannot be done alone. This is not work that can be done alone. It's not just Travel Oregon's work. This is Oregon's work. From residents to state agencies to all of us in the travel and tourism industry together. This is our work, to create a future of prosperity, equity, and stewardship across our great state. Today, as we contemplate our future, we remain steadfastly rooted in this legacy that we've built. We must take all that we've learned over the years and continue to better our industry with a thoughtful and disciplined intentionality. As I think about what the future holds for Oregon and for her travel and tourism industry, I think of opportunity. Think of what the governor said last night when she said, I think of three words, right? Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. I too think of opportunity and I think of hope. It's an opportunity for us to reflect and to learn. It's an opportunity for us to nimbly adapt and evolve to these new challenges that are before us. It's an opportunity for us all to grow. In just over three months, Oregon has the unprecedented opportunity that the governor spoke of last night to host the World Athletics Championships for the first time ever on US soil. We have 10 days to be able to provide the visitors to that event as well as the television viewing audience in 200 countries around the world. A glimpse of all that Oregon has to offer. I remember first being approached by the organizers of the World Athletic Championships, the folks that were interested in bidding on bringing that event to Oregon. And they said, Todd, can you imagine what this is gonna mean for the 10 days that this many people are gonna be in Oregon and staying in hotels and eating in restaurants and shopping in our stores? And I said, that's all lovely and it matters, but tell me more about the broadcast because the 10 days of the event are cool. That's great, that immediate economic infusion of resources into this, our, you know, into our lodging properties, into our restaurants, into our retail shopping, et cetera. It all matters. But to be able to reach a projected viewing audience of a billion people around the world with stories about Oregon, if we can embed some of our beautiful B-roll footage of the grandeur of this state into those, into those broadcasts, that's powerful because that's about the future 
this is an unprecedented opportunity for us. And it's just one example, just one, of the opportunities that are before us. Opportunities that we will want to strategically, thoughtfully, and courageously consider together. You know, I read an article recently that said, strategy is not a science. It is an art. It is an art of big thoughts, ongoing transparent communication, and constant adaptation. Strategy works best when we lay out an optimistic big picture and work out the contingencies as they come. How familiar does that sound over the last couple of years? Because we know those contingencies will come. Our nimbleness and our responsiveness as an, e uh, as an industry is our strength. I know it certainly is for the talented and gifted team of folks at Travel Oregon. And I would ask for them to all stand and that you all join me in thanking them for their devotion to the state of Oregon. The team at Travel Oregon, would you please stand? This, this team of folks want to connect with you. They want to hear your ideas. They want to listen to your thoughts, your concerns, your hopes for the future, and weave them together into our everyday work as well. And we also want to make sure that we thank you, each and every one of you, for your ongoing tireless commitment and passion. You make Oregon what she is. And you make the travel and tourism industry what she is for Oregon a primary driver of Oregon's economic future. Similarly, Oregon is very well served by a, by a group of volunteer members that make up the Oregon Tourism Commission. As you may know, members of the commission are appointed by the governor to oversee and approve agency budgets and the strategic plans, transformational strategies and, and framework, and that, that then direct the actions of the Travel Oregon staff. The role of a commission member is to really elevate their unique perspective, one that is garnered from their own personal and professional experiences working in and with the travel and tourism industry across our state, and to then bring that to a statewide, industry-wide level of thought and deliberation as they guide us at Travel Oregon in creating programs of work to support all of us as industry partners across the state. Please join me in welcoming, excuse me, not in welcoming, but in thanking the members of the Oregon Tourism Commission for their selfless service to the great state of Oregon. Would you all please stand so that we can recognize you as well? <laughs> Leading this group of volunteer leaders, is the chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission, Scott Youngblood. Chair Youngblood's a valued member of the commission. He served on various task forces. He served the commission as vice chair and now serves the commission as their chair. He's also the general manager of the Embassy Suites by Hilton at Washington Square, which by the way, was recently named one of the 100 best companies to work for in Oregon by Oregon Business Magazine. Would you please join me in welcoming to our stage the chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission, Scott Youngblood. Scott, come on up. Thank you, Todd. I've shared that 100 best thing story with a couple of you, and I despise it. Um, it was someone else's idea. And when we as a management team talk about it, we talk about the fact that this award expires at midnight daily. And if we, <laughs> and if, if, if we were to amount to anything, we have to re-earn it again tomorrow. Uh, and, and that becomes our, our effort because who wants to work in that organization? Ugh. That, friends, was the first of many digressions for which I apologize in advance. <laughs> Ms. O'Neill, I'm sorry. 
Uh, good morning, Oregonians, distinguished guests. It's an honor for each of us on the Oregon Tourism Commission to be with you here today. It fills my heart to reconnect with you in person. And while it may be hard to share handshakes and hugs and stories with each of our 300 physical attendees today, from all corners of the state, I'll be damned if I'm not going to try. So hang on. Um, if I may echo one or many of the themes that you've already heard, uh, something remarkable will be visited upon us in just a few short months. And at my Embassy Suites Hotel up in Washington County, we excitedly check our reservations each week and we marvel at the growing list of first-time visitors placing reservations planning to attend the World Athletics Championships in Eugene this summer. The impact that Oregon 22 will have on the state's travel and tourism industry, it's just, it's beyond compare. Lodging accommodations like mine are already filling up, but not just in the Portland metro area, in Roseburg, the McKinsey River Corridor, uh, Marcus's constituents over on the coast. First time visitors are going to experience not only the brilliant intersection of hallowed history and breathtaking modernity that is Hayward Field, but to extend their itineraries, to touch and taste many of the beautiful, the wild and wonderful places that we get to enjoy. Local economies will feel the boost as visitors rest in our hotels and eat in our restaurants and savor Oregon made products. The impact of Oregon 22 will certainly deliver an immediate economic benefit, but in addition, research reminds us that nearly 60% of these travelers will continue to buy Oregon products after returning home, with more than 30% purchasing Oregon products several times once they return home to share with their friends and families. And in doing so, they'll be sharing their Oregon experiences with loved ones as storytellers, as evangelists, even as they inspire themselves to plan their next return visit. And these folks are members of the tiny fraction of spectators who will physically get to be here for Oregon 22. The millions who watch these events from across North America and around the world will also be inspired by what they see on screen. And so we naturally expect Oregon 22 to deliver future visits for years to come. And I'm doing it again, Teresa, I'm digressing again, because Todd literally just covered all of that. It's text or something. You don't need me for this, you're fine. While Todd was introducing me a few minutes ago, I was reminded of the immense honor that, uh, that I get to serve as chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission and that we get to share as members of the Tourism Commission. I personally get the unparalleled joy of sharing this experience with these people, these eight colleagues, as partners and appointed members of the best volunteer gig in the state. Oh my God. Together we execute our statutory responsibilities to evaluate and approve the state age, our state agency's strategic plans and budget. We appoint and direct and advise the CEO and set their compensation. And as members of the Oregon Tourism Commission, we get to witness the magic. Even as it's being made, the magic made by our Travel Oregon team. We get to see under the hood Anybody here get frustrated by mixed metaphors? I'm gonna to try to jam five in here. <laughs> we get to hold front row, courtside, backstage, VIP, golden tickets. <laughs> That's dumber than the thing I said yesterday. <laughs> Silly. Uh, to work with this unbelievable collective of passion and talent, the Travel Oregon team. Folks, if you're able to invest five minutes, as I know you will, into meeting someone new today or tomorrow, this week, I beg of you, try to make it a member of the Travel Oregon team. And when you're shaking hands and introducing yourself and asking them about their work, listen for their love language. When you ask them about their work, ask them why it matters. 
learn about their inspiration, their drive, their commitment to this place and your people. As commissioners, we have an open opportunity to do this every single day. And as representatives of Oregon's tourism industry, we are bestowed with more than the responsibility and confidence to evaluate and adopt the agency's strategic direction and approve budgets. We're also endowed with the inheritance of a legacy, one of demonstrated achievement as a highly regarded and responsible state agency and a competitive engine, lest we forget it's not all altruism, a competitive en engine for enhanced prosperity across Oregon. This legacy comes from the partnership and well-earned confidence we have in our Oregon travel staff and partners. To each member of Travel Oregon's team and on behalf of all of my colleagues here, the members of the Oregon Tourism Commission, past and present, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And again, it's all redundant. You just got to thank the Oregon Tourism Commission and the Travel Oregon staff, but I would encourage you uh, to do it again throughout the day and throughout tomorrow. Since 2003, travel and tourism in Oregon has grown into a powerful and well-tuned economic engine. Now I'm just repeating myself. Despite adversity and setbacks along the way, your dedication and perseverance and innovation, oh my Lord, the innovation have driven us forward together. Here becomes, here comes the, uh, uh, the uh, abuse of the word together. And so today we are here together in 2022, after two full years of thr living through the unimaginable, and today our industry and our economy are pushing forward together toward a full recovery and an optimistic future. Friends, I'd like to share some of the sentiments that we discussed during yesterday's Tourism Commission meeting. These bear repeating today and sharing with our colleagues throughout each region and around the state. We are grateful for you, our industry partners, who care so deeply about our people and this place. We are grateful for your participation in the stakeholder engagement sessions, for your rich diversity of experience and perspective, and for the generous and thoughtful feedback shared on the draft transformational strategy. We're eager as a community, we as a community, to deliver a strong and sustainable 10-year strategy together and as chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission, I personally thank you as we work together to shape and hone a strategy that serves all Oregonians as your thoughtful meditation informs the dialogue we get to have and our shared collaboration, even as we engage in highly spirited debates and share diverse perspectives, this process helps us work through mistakes and misunderstandings and focus our collective energy to deliver a transformational strategy that guides us toward the shared vision of a prosperous future for all Oregonians. A, fu a future of racial equity throughout Oregon, a future of stewardship where we learn to teach others how to care for the places and people who call our wondrous state home, a future which ensures that Oregon can be um, Oregon, uh, not just now, but for the next seven generations. Even as we commit to driving Oregon's economy and prosperity forward, we also commit to remembering the important lessons that have shaped who we are, where we have been, and perhaps most importantly, where we are going. Friends, before we head to our breakout sessions, I am honored to introduce a special guest. Jason Graham, better known as Mosley Wada, is a Chicago transplant, currently living just up the road. I don't know directions from this ballroom in Bend. His work spans nearly two decades, exploring mediums, including writing and painting, performance and video. His music, literary performance, and visual art have been featured internationally and recently at the Oregon Business Leadership Summit, and he is a recent Fields Fellow 
with OCF and Oregon Humanities. Here today for a thought-provoking and inspiring spoken word performance, please join me in warmly welcoming to the Travel Oregon stage, Mosley Wada. Y'all getting good with the words. You're starting to say all the things that I would have said. So I'm like, oh, well, maybe I'll change this little piece. Um, uh, in researching this, um, oh, can I take a picture? Because some of my friends don't believe that people hire me to talk to them. Because <laughs> sometimes, because I just say what I say. You can flip a bird, you can hide your face, whatever you feel like. Hang on. Okay. That's kind of like consent. Uh, fellas. Okay. selfie okay um oh that's true i guess well it'll be on i'll put it on instagram follow me at killy holiday uh when we were when i was um researching this and the variety of ways that i edited it edited it and stuff i was thinking about um trying to figure out why we call it oregon and to find that we don't we're not totally sure on the origin of oregon and that that is in and of itself like a nice sign that um, we're not totally fixed, that we're, you know, pun intended, kind of a fluid state. It's not, totally, it's not totally for certain. And especially as an artist, that uncertainty is of a great value. It's of a great value. We just got rocked by a lot of uncertainty. So now we have a collective sort of veteran hood with uncertainty. But that really is the, the advantage. Um, Destination is adjourned when the journey destiny kind of a thing. Deference made the difference kind of a thing. Um, in this, I'm going to use the word intelligence, which is here to be synonymous with care. And care these days seems to be a revolutionary act is what I'm saying. Uh, has anybody said thank you to the sound and audio and video folks? Have we said? Thank you. to hear the holy words, but who amplifies them? Okay. Uh, and the lady uh, and folks that were cleaning out the bathrooms. Like, my goodness, I'm, se I'm serious. From Really, though, first clap? Okay. Okay. Um, as it all pertains to what I'm going to say. First, let me say, we are all native to somewhere and all immigrants from somewhere. Not to disparage our personal heritages, we have all traveled a great distance to be here, and we must really look at that. And we also must look at the beauty of this place and what makes this place so attractive, made by the many layers, social and geological, ethical and organic, current and historic. We must look at where we have been powerfully generous to each other and where we have been powerfully cruel to each other and the places that we exist. We are finding the strength to look at what we have done and how to do it differently. And with effort, we will mend our woundings. Um, pause. The reason for the bathroom part. Uh, there's nothing really especially uh, romantic or triumphant uh, or explosive or exciting about care. It's a lot of little steps. Parents in the house know exactly what I'm talking about. It is often in the thankless areas where the most important work is being done. Um, and however we finally come to the truth of our past and current histories, however we, it is that we decide not to look away from what makes us who we are, as we remember to embrace these many layers and uh, to see where beauty and strength can be found when we lose sight of who we are. Kid and a parent are driving a long, long road. After a fashion, the kid says, hey, yeah, why do we hang dream catchers from the rear view mirrors? Just then someone cuts them off. They swerve, almost crash, almost go over the side, punches the brakes, hits the horn, flips the bird, guns the gas, fists around the steering wheel, tight with anger. Parent says as if shouting to the other drivers, we hang them dream catchers from the mirrors because all these drivers are asleep at the wheel. They laugh. But it's not funny, too much adrenaline, too much fear. 
they continue driving the long, long road. After a fashion, the parent says to the kid, why do you think we hang dream catchers from the rear view mirror? Without pausing, the kid says, because looking back can be a nightmare. They go quiet. After a fashion, they start crying. Crying so hard they can't see that long, long road anymore. They have to pull over. Their crying becomes one sound. It goes very high. It goes very low. It goes on for a long, long time. Eventually, breathing slows, hearts rest, eyes clear. They reach out towards each other, hugging each other. And the world, their whole world seems richer, as if they are seeing each color for the first time anew. They begin again to travel on the long, long road. And no one asks, are we there yet? Shout out to folks who talk to trees and a juicy middle finger for all the bleach paper it takes to print up the Lorax books. Please note I am using bleach paper to perform this. Hypocrites make some noise. <laughs> Thought there would be more noise. Um, kudos to taking the risk to do this big, big work. On your website it says, here's my hustle where I get paid to tell you what somebody else wrote. This is like a supreme form of plagiarism. I think I'm very clever here. Uh, on your website it says, reimagining, important word there, how tourism contributes to a better life for all Oregonians, how travel enhances people and places and contributes to equitable livability, good. How we can create more economic resilience for the industries and our diverse workforce, great. Assessing our destination, our role as a destination management organization, DMO, our business practices and undergoing an organizational, organizational design process to better lead and support Oregon's tourism industry. Doing all of this through the raci the, a racial equity lens. Boom! <laughs> that's, a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of work. That sounds like a lot of work. That's a <laughs> C-H-I-T, chit ton of work. Um, and, for, <laughs> Great, okay. Um, fun though it may be, not making fun at all of us. Uh, somebody had to take the risk to write it down, to say what we have been thinking and what we have to do. Fair to say, fair to say, but, and we know this, words never have to hold the weight of their own gravity or show up for the consequence of their merit, but we as people do. As people, it is our job to carry clear the abstraction of a word's intent. Uh, we know the power of the words. I'll talk about that in a second, but like, check a sundown, check a treaty, check uh, the definition of utopia. Feel how that feels when those words get said. Um, you can't really capture it all in the words. It's, it is the experience of it. Just like you can't capture Oregon in one sunny day snapshot, selfie or otherwise, you have to hold space for light and shadow both to get even kind of close to the full picture, the full family album. So brief, brief caution here. It's one thing to say something like racial equity, but it's what it's pointing at. The bigger vision, which includes all forms of identity prejudice, not assigned or consigned alone to human beings, drum roll for the eye roll, but really though, that is what you are spelling out with words you have chosen. And words are, as we know, powerful. They are very strong. As we know, letters spell words, but words cast spells. So please note, equity is not just a word made recently popular by the fear of being called a racist. It's not a political adjunct or a cultural brand. It is an ecologically informed baseline. It is an endless and frankly unavoidable reality for the sentient, transient creatures we all are. Where's my spot? Here. So, Whomever wrote those words on your site, they get this. They understand equity like freedom or love or death is a choice we cannot escape. It invites us to hear the rhythm of a baseline and you can try to push against equity, which we have structural evidence of doing everywhere. Like you can try to put a wall in a river 
or you can try to keep a golf course green in the desert, or you can try to keep a whole state white, and that may appear to work for a time. Starts as a whisper, then becomes a scream. How did bottled water get inside the village stream? It may hold for a time, but then comes a time when you have to reassess, or as you more beautifully put it, reimagine what needs happen now. And then please note, the last thing, because <laughs> it just functionally doesn't work, the last thing that I want to do is alienate anyone here. We all know the dangers of isolation as punishment. This is not an attack on golfers or people who identify as white. If you're going to golf, golf. If you're going to white, white. <laughs> but also, seriously, join us in the dance of equity. Move to the baseline. Move to the rhythm of that baseline. Join us in that dance. Audit the emotional and ecological expense of your enjoyment's cost, both river and revenue streams. Attend to areas that pool in stagnation or overflow in excess. Attend to the actual water hazards as well as the recreational ones. Have both. Have both and more. Reimagine, as you say. But let us look at the many layers of our heritage. One that includes exclusion and acquisition, conquest and control, ignorance and prejudice. Let us look at how we advertise and what we advertise and honestly ask ourselves, are we perpetuating a conquering narrative? Are we romanticizing a West that was never one, knowing no one is one if we can't have it too, you know? Do we still want to do this? Is it still working? Was it ever working? Are we not right now cleaning up the error in arrogance and the ego in Oregon? How can we help each other to get to the core of what we want in accord with what need be? How do we move to that baseline? And then, when we get to that baseline, from this place, send out the invitation to join in, into a place where equity is the economy of resilience. Just as diversity is the nature of our heritage, the revenue will come as a natural byproduct of the cultural prerogative to actively engage in the stewardship of this pricelessness that we all share as collective sentient beings in this collective sentient ecological system. Logical from logos to employ or implore with reason or intelligence. That's you, the employing intelligence. Eco or echo from oikos, meaning house, meaning home. That's all of us. And if, as they say, home is not a single place, if it travels, if, as they say, home is where the heart is, then the wealth of our systems will come when with our hearts, we employ this intelligence. Let that be our reputation. Let that be our future history. And let that be how we travel Oregon. Thank you very much. OK, now a selfie. Yeah, now stand up. Now we'll catch a selfie. Hey. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Less, less orange juice next time. It doesn't functionally make a lot of sense. I think you'll find no less orange juice. OK, I ruined it. OK. Thank you, Jason, for those really thought-provoking words. Oh, and those are <laughs> Just a few housekeeping items. I know all of you are probably eager to get up and do a little stretching. So just a couple friendly reminders. On the back of your badge is your QR code. So that is your schedule for the next couple of days. If you have any trouble accessing it, just flag me or come by the uh, conference registration. Immediately following this session is our sponsor and exhibitor break. So I fully expect all of you to give them some extra love. So grab a beverage and get to talking. Um, immediately following the break, we have four inspiring breakout sessions, so check your schedule on your QR code to locate the session topics and the room locations. We are excited to welcome vendors from the High Desert Food Trail from 12.15 to 2 p.m. at our networking lunch in the Great Hall, so make sure to stop by and enjoy a delicious lunch. We have limited, limited openings for our Y Guides tours tonight. If you're interested and you have not currently signed up for a Y Guides tour, please check with conference registration for our availability. If you have decided not 
to attend your tour tonight. There are a lot of people on the waiting list, so please stop by conference registration and let us know if your plans have changed. So thank you guys for an awesome morning. Go get to the breakout sessions, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.